unto Isaiah chapter 54, begin at verse 1 and down through 8. It says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine, inhab of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cause, strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left. They and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thou makest is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. For the Lord has called thee as a woman forsaken, and grieved in spirit, and a wife of you, when thou wilt refuse, saith thy God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercy will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord, our Redeemer. Uh, we want to talk about changing our strength. I, am, I, I, I believe that when we talk about the joy of the Lord, that it is our strength, and we need to enter into his strength. Uh, I think uh, early on this year, we talked about the tabernacle plan of God. We talked about the different uh, dimensions. And, and I, I hate to use those kind of words a lot of time because sometimes when you use a word like dimension, it, it may not be coming across. Uh, I may not be saying it exactly like you might be understanding but again, I, let me express that in, in the spirit or in the spiritual dimensions, you know, you do have dimensions. And each dimension brings about a different set of problems or promises, blessings, or whatever you want to say. Uh, it's just like uh, Israel and Egypt, they lived in a dimension of having God without knowing God. Even though God was with them, they had no, no knowledge of who he was. In the second dimension, he brings them into the wilderness where God begins to reveal himself unto them. And once he began to reveal himself, now he wants to take them to another dimension where they can see God really be God in their midst. In other words, it's that there is a dimension of God where it's all God. In the tabernacle, you had the outer court, you had the in a sanctuary, then you have the holies of holies. Each one of these had a different dimensional thing that you done. Like in the first order of business is what you would do. The second order of business is what God did with you. And in the third order of business, it's what God done, period, by himself. My desire and your desire should be is that God will become all in all. And trying to get in that dimension where that it is God. Now, the greatest need of our hour is for God's people to abandon their own abilities. And one of the, the things that is hard to do is to forget what you are capable of doing, even spiritual abilities, and begin to depend upon Christ for everything. You know, we sing some songs sometimes, you know, I can't, talk, I can't walk, you know, unless God does it for me. Really, the song is true. Really, that's where we would desire to be, where God is in complete control and God is directed. Many of us have been, as far as Pentecost, we've had a Pentecostal experience, and a Pentecostal experience is a second dimensional experience. It's more like a wilderness experience, but it was not the ultimate of God to give us just a wilderness experience. But our wilderness experience is what gives us knowledge of God and see God do things that we know that he is God, that only God can do. Uh, there are certain things that God will 
bring us to in, in the old covenant and the old uh, testament. Uh, every time God wanted you to know him differently, he brought you to a different problem. There was, never was a promise without a problem to get the promise. There was always something facing, something that had to be conquered, stepped over, whatever, to receive the promise. No promise was ever without a problem. The promise of a promised land had a problem of Egypt. If you're going to get the promise of the promised land, you had to come out of Egypt. Matter of fact, you had to come through the wilderness. And so when you get to the promised land, you will think God's going to give you the promised land, but that poses another problem. He brings them to the promised land at a time when the river Jordan was overflowing its banks, and which made it an impossible journey to get to the other side. And so when he get to that place of impossibility, because what God wants you to really see in him is that there is nothing impossible to them that believe. No, the, the, uh, the, the river Jordan was quite an awesome sight because it had overflowed its banks and, and every place I've ever studied and read about it, it says that at that place where that river overflowed, it was one mile wide. That's a long, I, I, I can't even swim a mile. That was a wide river. Not only was it a, it would be one thing if it was a lake, but it's a river. You understand about a river, a river flows. If it flows out of its bank, it means that it grabs everything on the banks and put it in the water. You may step into the water and get a tree limb in the brain. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen in running water. You don't know what's coming down the pike. But to trust God means that I've got to step without fear, not knowing what I'm stepping into, because when I step into this river, I don't know what's going to happen. But nothing was going to happen until somebody stepped into the water, right? You, you could stand back and say, boy, I don't think I can get across there. You, you couldn't. But if God says you can, guess what? You can. Oh, well, praise God. So it is in this that uh, we're trying to figure out exactly what is it that God is desiring. What is God wanting us to do? Uh, and, and, and what we've got to do is that we've got to learn how to look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We have to look unto him, no matter what. I've got to look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. There is always this pressure on us and expectation to, to save the world, empty the hospitals, uh, empty the prisons, all these different things that we feel like we need to do. And there is a pressure on us sometimes to, to do or want to do those things. Uh, you look out, I look out. When I look out into the world today, I will say there's a whole lot of people that need Jesus. <laughs> well, would you agree to that? Yeah, when you look outside your door, because basically right now, if you look where you live, how many people that live where you live even know who Jesus is? So there becomes this pressure on us sometimes to say, well, I need to tell them about Jesus. They need to know about Jesus, which they do. But sometimes are we willing to allow God to treat us like he's treated everybody else? Are we willing to allow God to treat us like he did Abraham and Sarah? You know, uh -oh, what do you mean? Well, Elkanah and Hannah. Uh, you know, Hannah had Samuel. She was a barren woman. You know, Sarah, she was a barren woman. And are we willing to allow the Lord to put us in his positions to bring out of us what he wants to bring out of us? Uh, we and everybody else, I mean, everybody around Sarah was having babies. Hagar was having kids. Everybody around Hannah, Panana, she was having kids. She was dropping babies like dropping bad habits. She had babies everywhere. But the pressure for us sometimes is, is trying to 
be successful or look successful because we think they're successful. The most successful thing you can do is be in God. You cannot help but be successful in God because the standard of success is not what the world says success is. And I realize today is that, you know, kind of subtle like the world has us thinking what success is. You want me to tell you what we think success is? It's a three-bedroom house, a one-and-a-half-car garage, good job, and all, and all these things are great. But my success is not based upon that. Okay, now, they say you have a three-bedroom house, one-and-a-half-car garage, and one-and-a-half kids. How are you going to have a half a kid? I don't know. But <laughs> the American dream is that. And so what we do as people sometimes that come into the kingdom of God, we're going to base our success in God based upon the standard that's been set that says you do this, you are successful. You know, we have plaques on the wall. I don't know how many times, you know, you go, well, you know, I got mine in my office. <laughs> I got my little degree up there. I got my high school diploma. Uh, I even got my discharge from the Army. I got some things that I have succeeded in. And, and a lot of times we are mesmerized. You know, you go into a place, he's got, he's got a Ph.D. certificate and he's got uh, a master's certificate. And, and you get, oh, man, wow, you know, wow. You know, my son called me there last night. He thought Adam was kind of dumb. Well, he did. He thought he missed something. And I said, you know, sometimes you can look at things the wrong way. I said, he, he thought, he said, Dad, I've been thinking about Adam. He said, Adam, he didn't know that much, did he? I said, no, Adam knew everything. He said, uh, what do you mean? Dad, he didn't know he was naked. I said, God gave Adam everything he needed to know. He knew it. He didn't want Adam to know he was naked. Because that wasn't important. I said, but when God breathed into Adam, guess what he breathed in him? He breathed in his wisdom and everything that God was, he breathed it into him and he became a living soul. And it wasn't until Adam realized, let somebody else talk him out of it, that he realized he was naked, but he'd been naked all his life. But see, that's the whole thing is that he was created with the wisdom of God already. I said, how could he name animals? And name the things of God if he didn't have the wisdom of God to do it. And so he didn't go to school. I said, you, see, our, our whole concept of, 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 of knowing sometimes is based upon a lot of criteria now that come from a fallen nature. You know, we, and I'm not against getting educated because I believe in education. I believe learning is a part of life. I believe you want to learn something every day. That's me. But it goes to show you that when Adam was created, it's that everything he needed to know, God had already breathed in him to know. And now we're trying to fight back to get back what was lost in that translation. We want to get to the place where our wisdom is coming from where? Above. We don't want wisdom that comes from my house school of learning. That's all well and good. But I want the wisdom of God that wisdom that come down from above. It's not central, it's pure. Easily to be entreated, easily to be accepted. And so that's the wisdom we're looking for. And so we have to resist, we have to resist the pressure of trying to base our success up on a standard that's not set by God. Being successful in God is being able to hear the voice of God at all times. If I'm going to be real successful in God, it's because I can hear him, because he has all wisdom. He's given me wisdom. Really, he's given me every, all the wisdom I would ever need. I have, but I've got to learn how to release that in me. And I, and I know you keep hearing me saying that because I believe that what God done is, is good. I believe that what God done is perfect. What I have is an imperfect sometimes understanding 
of what God has done. So I need to learn how to release that which he has done in me. It's got to come out of me. Praise God. It's got to come out. It's him that needs to be seen. Matter of fact, is that God wants to change our strength. From Adam? How many of y'all think Adam was strong? You know he was. But God is trying to make a, 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 a change here. He wants us to leave this strength to get in his strength. I, I, I know how to operate in Adam. But I need to leave Adam. God is trying to get me out of Adam so he can get me in the second Adam or the new man so I learn what the real strength of God really is. Because if, 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 if we're not careful, we're instead of trying to strengthen this old man that's always fighting against the new man. And we're giving more strength to the old man and, and the strength of God is not being displayed or experienced in the new man. That's why the Bible says our growth is an inward growth. Our growth is the inward man and the renewing is the renewing of that inward man, that inward experience that we have already had in Christ. It should be getting stronger. It should be getting better. Isaiah uses the idea of the barren women to kind of portray a truth that I believe applies to us even today. And, 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 and sometimes that we're, again, is that we're always looking beyond and outside of us to try to figure out us. Now it's time to look to him to figure out who you really are. I think that it's so important that you never forget who you are. I think you got to know who you are before you can even tell anybody who they are. <laughs> I got to know me. I got to know the Jesus in me. I, get, I got to know. My knowledge is what caused me to be successful in him. It's the knowledge of God. However that knowledge come, I've got to know him. I was telling them again this morning in the uh, meeting is that and most people tell you, the worst, one of the hardest prayers you ever pray in this walk in God is that, Lord, I want to know you. That's it. Y'all want to pray this morning? <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to pray it with me today. Because I, I know he's going to want you to know him too. He wants you to know him more than I want you to know him. But one of the hardest prayers to pray and I know it sounds real good man I want to know you and then what happens is that you want to know God and he wants you to know him but you we want to know a controlled God we want to know a, a God that we still got control over but when God wants you to know him he's going to take all that away from you so that you really can know him and you'll come away with a testimony saying now I know him there are testimonies that cannot be taken from you once you have the knowledge of who he is. Because having a knowledge of who he is will let you know who you are. If I know who I am, identity is everything. You know, I, 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 you know, I, I grew up in a town where you had certain people in the city had a cloutful name, had clout in their name. If you said... I'm a Jones, that meant something because the Jones were some bad boys, all right? And all they would do is show up and tell you, my daddy named Sam Jones. But that tells me you got to back up off of them because if not, you're going to have all of them on you. <laughs> but they grew up knowing they were Joneses and every last one of them would act like Joneses. And they thought because their name was Jones, everybody in the city was supposed to fear them. Well, I'm going to cut the story off right there because my name was Wilson. <laughs> but he uses this, this picture of a barren woman that really kind of helped us understand that barrenness, especially in the Old Testament, is a curse. And to be barren is to look like a curse 
and people will, first thing they're going to ask you, you must be cursed. And every woman that didn't have a child, you know what she felt like? I'm a curse. Because it was not popular to be able to have kids. It's not like 2014. Today, nah, <laughs> nah I just say that. I ain't going to even say that. The world has changed. Yes, and and it, it used to be is that they thought they were blessed that they had kids. Today is different. As a matter of fact, I, I've heard, I used to, it used to really get to me when I hear you be listening to these celebrities and they're saying, well, I don't want no kids right now because I'm, I'm getting my career together. <clears throat> As if you're going to minimize your greatest call in the motherhood for career. Now, I, 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 I'm sorry. You know, we have purposes here. Part of the purpose of being here is repopulation. I haven't read any place in the Bible where it was a curse to have kids. Matter of fact, it's just the opposite. It was a blessing because when I reproduce a child, that child belongs to God. The Bible says everything that comes to the matrix is holy unto the Lord. Matter of fact, the Bible didn't let me know. He gives me the child to raise, but the ultimate thing is the child belongs to him. That's why in your raising kids, there comes a time when you need to release them back to their owner. My Blessing God is having these kids because they really don't belong to me. They're mine, but they're really not mine. They really do belong to him. The fruit of the womb belongs to the Lord. Well, praise God anyhow. Oh, hallelujah. So uh, it was in that old covenant or the Old Testament or in the olden times when uh, the, the, the strength of a household was determined on how many kids they could produce. That's why Hannah prayed so hard. That's why Sarah, looking around, got everything, but she don't have no kids. Hannah, same way, had a husband, loved her to death, gave her anything she wanted, but the one thing he couldn't give her was a child. And the thing that Hannah, and, and most of us have been just happy, you know, eating caviar, and have him maize. <laughs> a, a, a gold card that we could charge every day and get it whatever we want. We'd have been happy. But not in that day. Because you feel like you done missed something in life. You know, I have my, my kids, they, they talk about, man, I no, don't ever want no kids. She said, how'd you get here? You better be glad I wasn't thinking like that. <laughs> You know, you, you owe me. You owe me some grandkids. <laughs> yeah, you owe me some grandkids. Because if I was thinking like that, you wouldn't be here. So I feel like part of my reward for being a part of you being here, you owe me something. You owe me some kind of grandkid I can hold. Well, let's keep going. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. That's just, I'd hate for us to get that thought in our mind that, you know, uh, get selfish and self-centered and realize that, well, you know, kids get in the way like you didn't get in the way. Man, kids are a lot of trouble like you wasn't no trouble. Huh? You, need, you, deserve, you deserve to have some of the same stuff that I went through with you. <laughs> you need to get paid back. <laughs> so when it came... And so when it came to God, and it seemed like in most instances in God, instance in God, when God had a special purpose for a special people, it seemed like these barren mothers were the one that produced a miracle child. Sarah couldn't have a baby, but she produced a miracle child named Isaac. Hannah couldn't have no kids. But she ended up producing a miracle child named Samuel. 
And you can go all through here noticing that usually when there was something real special about that child, it usually was born a miracle. Praise God. It was born a miracle. And, and, and Samuel, Samson, John the Baptist, remember? Man, his, his mama, she was on grand, grandmother's day when she had him. <laughs> She's 80-some years old. Old. Don't get me wrong now. I told God I'm good. <laughs> I wouldn't even give somebody else a chance. <laughs> I don't need no more. But I hope to God. Now, I, I, I would hope that he don't ever feel like he need to give me something miraculous <laughs> at this stage of the game. Oh, God, please. Oh, we both be in the crazy house. But it was necessary for God to intervene in those situations where that it looked like uh, nothing could happen, but then we know that when it happened, it was God. So many times it's that God uses these people to bring back, rebuild the old waste places and the things that had fallen down. Uh, Samuel came back. He was a man who the Bible say not one word ever fell from his lips to the ground. And so he was very good at bringing God back to a people that should have known who God was. Uh, today I feel like we are too rich sometimes in our own ways. We speak of God's men of faith and power instead of really recognizing the faithfulness and the powerfulness of God. You know, we want to never forget how faithful and how powerful God really is. Praise God, that's not anything that God cannot do. Sometimes we become too far in becoming man-centered instead of adoring and, and, and uh, worshiping the Holy One of Israel and giving glory unto the only one that needs to have that glory. So God blesses those who are uh, meekly dependent on him, but turn away from those that are filled with their own abilities. If, if I go to God, like I said, it's like Moses on the mountain. He's got a stick. He's got a, a rod. And, uh, I, you know, on the Ten Commandments, when I seen the movie, he was bad with that stick before he ever came up on the mountain. He could take that stick and whoop people with it. You know, he had ability to be quite a soldier with that rod he had before it ever took it to the mountain. Uh, Y'all seen that movie, didn't you? Y'all ain't seen that one? Man, I've seen that thing so many times. I remember going to the show when I was a kid seeing that because you stayed all day. That was the longest movie. Man, you eat more popcorn sitting there just watching that movie. It had an inter intermission and everything. Boy. But anyway, let's get away from that. Sometimes our theology gets messed up because of movies because we think, you know, they, they got to sell you entertainment. But, uh, but it does say he did mighty works. He's a man of great words and mighty works. And so I do know that he probably was. He whipped those guys around that well and I think he probably used that stick to do it. And that was his stick. That's why God says, you know what? When he came up on the mountain, he said, uh, uh, what you got in your hand? He said, you know, that stick that he had, they, they say that stick would have been like a tent pole if he needed sleep. He would take his outer garment off, hang it over that big stick, and sleep on it. That stick was protection. Everything he needed it was in that stick. So what a God says, I want you to take this stick and throw it down. He throws the stick down. Because what he's laying down is his abilities. He's laying down his ability. Because his ability did what that stick was awesome. God said, lay it down. And then all of a sudden, God takes his stick and turns it into a snake. He said, now pick it up. I would have told God, that ain't my stick. <laughs> that, that, that's not mine. <laughs> but not only do he want to pick it up, but he wanted to pick the stick up by the tail. Pick that stick up, uh, and it's a snake wiggling. And I think it was a king snake, big snake. Yeah, because a king snake can kill a cobra. Egyptians believe in cobra worship. But a king snake can eat up a cobra, no matter how bad that cobra is. Matter of fact, the king snake is not subject 
to the venom in the cobra. Wow, isn't that something? So what, what Moses gave back to God, I mean what God gave back to Moses was the same stick that had been submitted into the hands of God and God gave it back and no longer is it Moses' stick, it is the rod of the Lord. Even with us, all of our abilities, everything that we say we got and can do, I don't care if it's a master's degree in sociology, we take that master's degree and we throw it down and let God tell us to pick it back up. Because now once he gives it back to us, then we can use it like God wanted it to be used. And so Moses had no idea that this stick that God told him to pick back up it, it's a, really a bad stick. Now, it was kind of tough when he had it, but his ability fell real shut. No way could Moses lift that rod up and the Red Sea would part if it was Moses' stick. Huh? No way could he hit the walls with the stick and it turned to blood if it's Moses' stick. No way would he touch the dust and it turned to fleas and stuff if it's Moses' stick. But when that stick became the rod of God, it done even greater things than it was when it was the rod of Moses. Same thing with your abilities. You may have had some abilities that was great, but just think how much more greater your abilities become if you submit your abilities to God. If God gives them back to you, if you thought you was cooking a good pie in your own abilities, I bet you can cook a better one if I submit it to God. Okay, so we need, we need to realize is that there is a change of strength. We, there is a changing of strength and ability. I want to take everything that I've got, everything I am, submit that to God, and let God give it back. So then when he get what part he gives back, I know it will work because it's not mine anymore. It's his. Everything belongs to him. Praise God. In Luke chapter 1, in verse 53, he said, He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. In other words, is that when you feel, if you feel like that you have need of nothing, you're going away empty. But if you come to God with a hunger, he's going to fill you with good things. Are you ready to do big things for God? Are you ready to worship the great big I am? Are you ready to offer and, and give him glory? Of all the people in the world who had a remarkable testimony, who knew God was blessed with the spirit of power and revelation, none exceeded the apostle Paul. None exceeded this guy in, in revelations. I don't see many men in the Bible that even touch him in the knowledge of God as far as what God was able to reveal unto him. I don't see hardly any of them, even Peter, as great as he was. He was, had the keys to the kingdom, but when it came to the knowledge of God, I don't think anyone exceeded Paul in the revelations of God. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, beginning at verse 1, for he said, for we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of your trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. In other words, is that he looked at life as being an utter loss. It was despondent. It was very dark. But we had all the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead. In other words, Paul is saying to us, man, we, we have, I have been or we have been to the place of total despair even to the place where it would have been, have been better to die than to live. And like I said, it's that, and, and you that we have not, many have not been there, but you really haven't really lived. Life doesn't become sweet, sweeter, until you have to come to one of those places where it would have been better to die than to live. But once you get past that, you realize, I'm glad I didn't die. <laughs> I'm glad I live. Amen. One bad day cannot make me want to die. I'm going to want to live. Let me get up the next morning. I'm glad 
God, yeah, oh, now I ain't going to lie. Yeah, I have prayed. God going to kill me. Yeah, I've been sick. I got sick one time, man. I don't like to be sick. I had the flu so bad. I was head stopped up, room spinning on me, man. I just feel all the necessary. And I said, God, please, you know, just go on and kill me. But instead, he healed me. And I was so glad the next day that he didn't take me up on my word. <laughs> I'm so glad that it wasn't nothing but a mild case of the flu, and I just hated to be antagonized with it. And I started saying, God, you know, it, it's just like, uh, like, you know, Elijah the prophet, you know, man done called down fire from heaven. Man, he done seen all kinds of things happen. Fire licking up water and, you know, done had a great day, what we call a shouting good time. And, and the very next moment, the very next day, you know where this dude is at? He's running. He's sitting under the tree talking about God going to kill me. <laughs> I ain't, I'm just like everybody else. But he was like everybody else when you was calling out fire from heaven. It wasn't your fire. It was God's fire. Yet nothing really changed. You're still the same person. But you hear one, he had one bad a uh, uh, report come to him by a woman named Jezebel says, you know what? Whoever killed my prophets this time tomorrow, I'm going to have his head. He heard that boy. He took off running. Man, now wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now you just stood up here and called fire down from heaven. You done killed 400 and in that day 850 prophets and all died. And you have one woman over here that says, this tomorrow, I'm going to have his head. Friend, if I call down fire the day before, I'm going to believe I'm going to call down fire the next day too. But somehow, he got so despondent and so felt so rejected that he felt like, God, just come on and kill me. Just go on, let me die. Just go on, take me on out of here. And God told him then, man, get up, get up. Told him, get on, drink you some water. <laughs> Go ahead and drink. He, he just wanted to sip. No, drink it. Now eat that bread. He said, because what I'm about, I'm giving you a meal that's going to last you 40 days. And you're going to go in the strength of that. Isn't this something what God can give us at our most lowest moment, what God can feed us to make us go on? He said, I'm not even through. He said, get on up. I see you want to die. Don't worry about it. I got you covered. I'm going to bring somebody else. I got another guy I'm working on, but I got to keep you going until I get that guy together. Oh. Second Corinthians says, chapter 4, we have trouble on every side, yet not distressed. <laughs> we are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Every one of that, that whole message there is almost one of all negative just about it, except for what he says after. I am, what he says, I'm troubled, distressed, perplexed, persecuted, cast down. There's nothing positive about any one of those things. But the thing that I like about it, with every one of those things of negative, there's a positive. Everything that happened, he shows another side of this thing. I may have been cast down. I, I may have been perplexed. I may have been persecuted. I may have been all this. But in all that, I've never been forsaken. You know, God has been there no matter what. Uh, I was cast down, but guess what? I wasn't destroyed, you know, persecuted. But guess what? I got over it. And so there's so many things that's a positive with a negative because if there is a negative, there has to be a positive. But the negative is you that what produces the positive in God. We must be able, must be made barren sometime before the eternal life of God can be bought into view. The Jews of Jerusalem or the kingdom of God uh, is comprised of people whose natural strength has been exchanged for the strength of God. It's these who will rebuild places destroyed by what we call Antichrist stuff. Is that we, we're in the rebuilding program. We're trying to get restoration. Uh, you know, like I told my son, when he thought Adam was born or created dumb. See, he wasn't created dumb. I said, when God breathed in him, he breathed in him God's wisdom. And so here, the one thing that God is trying to do to us, 
even now, it's once again reproduced that same wisdom. And then sometimes in order to get that wisdom, you've got to lose all you got to get his wisdom. You have to become null and void so that God's wisdom can be demonstrated so that you can, his wisdom is not like ours. There's a whole lot of logical things I can do that make sense to me but wouldn't make sense to God. And the thing he does usually don't make sense to me. Uh, well, I, it, it don't make sense to me if you just got a word that can heal somebody. Why would you make mud balls? I mean, why, why put mud, spit in people's eyes? See, that don't make sense to me. Do it make sense to you? Would y'all let me spit on you right now? <laughs> if I told you I can spit on you and make you heal, would you try it? Nope. Nope, I can tell you right now, I know how it is. Come here, come here. Let me, oh, 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 you got a sore throat? Here, let me spit down your throat. Mm, not me. I can't believe you're talking about spitting on me. Well, you know what? That's why when Jesus done what he done, can't nobody do what he do. You know, nobody does it like he can. He comes in, and, you know, God, he puts spit on a dude's tongue. You know, Papa guy's here, he can't hear. Poop. How's you doing now? Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, what about the other side? I can hear. I mean, he don't have no, uh, there's no special formula that I can really come up with to tell you that how God is going to do in your life what he needs to do. But this I do know is that if, if, he, if he does anything, it's going to be right. And when he does it, it will be right because he only knows how to do the right thing. His result, the way he gets you there may not be the right way, but it's his way of bringing it to you. Only God knows how to do that. Oh, hallelujah. Paul had an extraordinary revelation of paradise. And, and the Bible said, lest he be exalted in his own glory, lest he get exalted in himself, that God permitted Satan to attack his body or put a thorn in his flesh. Again, we can speculate on what that thorn was, and many have. Some said it was his eye. Some said this. The Bible does say that there was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. Uh, history says that every place he went, there was always someone there withstanding him. We do know that every place he went, there was either there was a revival, and then there's a ride. Every place he went, there seemed to be there's a revival, and then there's a ride. He stayed there too long. They taken him out, stoned him, killing him, trying to kill him. So we know that there was a lot of things that Paul faced, uh, even with his truth. Sometimes it's not always easy if you have the truth of God. It doesn't exempt you from affliction. It does not exempt you from having hard times. It will not exempt you from things happening to you. Because all these things, it's for his own purpose. And here is Paul. Here is uh, Paul praying repeatedly unto God that God... I could do my job better if you just take away the, this thorn in my flesh. I know what he would say because I'll be saying the same thing. God, I could do a better job if you just take this thorn out of me. <laughs> I, I, I know I could do a better job if you just relieve me of this pressure. You know, I know I could do a better job. But then finally, the Lord realized is that Paul really, probably like most of us, is looking at his ability. And God is not interested in my ability as much as he's interested in his purpose. And so I'm sitting here listening to Paul pray like men of us will pray, Lord, you know, take this thing from me. Remove this thing from me. And all the while, God is just as big with it in you as he would be if you didn't have it. He is just as strong with it the thorn in your flesh. Matter of fact, the Bible tells me he got stronger. The more Paul suffered with it, the stronger God got. I see y'all listening. Y'all thinking. I'm going through. I know it, but God is getting stronger. Lord, take it away. No. The Lord said, Paul, I heard you, but I, I want you to recognize something that you would never recognize 
my grace is sufficient and my strength is made perfect. Sometimes we want perfect strength. But perfect strength is born out of perfect weakness. Oh. Should I say it real slow? Sometimes we want perfect strength. When God really needs your perfect weakness so that you can see his perfect strength. And if I don't see his perfect strength, it might be I'm too strong yet. I have to find that his grace is sufficient. In my most weakest moment, I got to believe that his grace is sufficient. Matter of fact, I got to believe that his strength is being more perfect in my weakness than it is when I say I'm strong. Now, I know you're thinking, the Bible says, let the weak say I'm strong. Yeah, that's the word of faith. If I'm weak, I'm going to say I'm strong. I think that's good. I don't ever want to say I'm weak, but then again, I am weak when his strength is made perfect. But at the same time, if I think, think I'm weak, I need to declare what he said in his word so I can get what he said in his word. If I'm weak, then am I strong. Why? Because when I'm weak, the strength of God is made perfect in my life. Oh, praise God. And so when he said, my grace is sufficient, my strength is made perfect in weakness, no one enjoy. I, I, you know, I, I've never, never enjoyed taking a weak side. You know, we played basketball in the park. You could always tell who couldn't play. You know how? Nobody chose them. <laughs> and if we were playing a four-man team, you could tell who ranked high by who got chosen first. You really didn't want to be the fourth man chosen on the team, but you would accept that over being the guy that didn't get chosen at all. But no one and everybody in their own mind, you know, even when I couldn't play basketball, I thought I could. <laughs> Somewhere in my mind, I have this imagination. I was the shortest thing on the court. I could always see myself jumping up high and everybody, but I never could get it off. You know, I, 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 wouldn't, even try, I wouldn't even go to the basketball goal because I know he's going to block my shot. So I'd stand way back out there where ain't nobody on me and toss it up and hope that baby go in. And most time it did. And I said, wow, man, I'm, I'm strutting back like I done done something. Man, that's luck. <laughs> oh, God. Sometime when God began to... Uh, to uh, send us through this inhospital desert of life. Uh, uh, he had to bring them there because he wanted them to enjoy something better. How many of you, have, how many of you think right now you got all or got it as good as it's going to get? See, because if you think that right now, if you are satisfied and saying this is as good as it's going to get, then what I'm going to teach today is not going to help you none because you're already where you want to be. But what God wants me to understand is that, yeah, it is good, and I enjoy this. But at the same time, my soul hungers for more because I know there's a whole lot more than this. Okay? I thank God for the manna. He lets me eat every morning. I thank him for the rock he let me drink from. But I know there's more to this. You know, in wilderness, we fight. You remember, they fought. They had wars, they fought. They weren't even trained to fight, but they fought anyway. They wasn't soldiers, they were farmers, but they fought anyway. And of course, in that, they probably had a lot of tragedies and a lot of casualties. But when God says, you know what, when he finally bring them to the promised land, he said, now I'll tell you what I want you to do. Now from here and this day forward, no longer will you show up to fight. Because the battle is not, it ain't yours no more. When I enter, when you enter into the promised land, the fight is over. 
is because no longer is it your fight. I'm in his promise and God cannot lie and it's no chance of God lying. And so when I get in his promise, that means everything God promises is that he has to deliver. If I have an enemy, guess what? God has to take care of it. If I have whatever, God has to take care of it. That's third dimensional living. It's when you finally change strength. You're no longer trying to strengthen Adam, but you're trying to strengthen Christ in your life. There's a big change that happened. There's a transformation that should be happening in your life even now. Praise God. Once we have, have, once we have an immortality in our bodies, we are capable of causing great harm to God's creation. Is that once we have this in us, because if we handle the creation wrong and we don't do it right, we can cause a lot of damage. I mean, here is Adam. He has this ability in him. He caused all of creation to be affected by a decision he made. We are affected today by a decision he made when God put that in us. We must be taught, tested, taught, tested, taught, tested, even in this present world. Just when you think I had a test, guess what? There comes another test. Just when I pass that one, there comes another test. And it seemed like, it seemed like life is like this. Either I'm in a test or I am just got over a test or I'm getting ready to get back in one. Just when I think the yard has been mowed, it rains. And guess what happens when it rains? What I mowed the other day, I got to go and mow it again. I am looking I'm going to try to get in the mind of God. Maybe he can let me get a grass seed that only grow two inches. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, see there? Let it grow two inches and it won't grow no more. And all summer long, it stays two inches long. You never have to mow it. Now, see, there you go. Now, see some of y'all saying, hey, that can't happen. But you know what? They done made some big strawberries, too. I thought couldn't happen. Let me try it one time. Let me sell the seed until it backfires. After that, I'm out of business. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it, it, it's like life is all about a test. Every time you look around, it's a test. And if you don't recognize that, you think that life is picking on you. And many times people think life, I mean, we even think people wake up and pick on us. Man, I'd be all right if it weren't for them people. No, you wouldn't. It'd be another test. <laughs> you just have something else to deal with, you know. You'll get past the people and then there's another test. So life has been about taught, tested, taught, tested, Every word that you catch, because everything taught ain't caught. It's not so much what you taught, what you have been taught, but it's what have you caught that you taught, that was taught. I can be taught a lot of things, but unless I catch what was taught, I need to be taught again. And so the, the lesson of being taught is what did I catch in the teaching when it was being taught. Many things we'll hear. It don't catch us. We don't hear it. But uh, here it's a was taught, tested, even in this present world, is that we are constantly finding ourselves like Paul talked about, you know, persecuted, cast down, feeling forsaken, and all these different things that he talked about in Corinthians. But it's all a part of growing. It's all a part of knowing. It's all a part of, of getting revelation of God and knowing who he is. One of the greatest errors of today's Christian teaching is the emphasis on making the believer happy and prosperous in this present world. 
I know we get happy over that, but prosperity and all this, and I love all that, and I believe in prosperity. I believe in the whole life. When I talk about prosperity here, I'm talking about wholeness of life. I'm talking about both body, soul, and spirit. Sometimes we camp out on trying to be prosperous fleshly, but I'm, I'm not just wanting to be prosperous in my flesh. I want to be prosperous in my spirit. I want to be prosperous in my soul. I want to be a rounded, whole person. Prosperity means wholeness. I want my body healed if it's sick. That's prosperity. Uh, I want healing in my body. If I need healing, I want to be healed in my body. That's prosperity. I want to be whole. You know, I have talked to many people laying in the hospital rooms, sick, about to die. Then not one of them ever asked me or even could be concerned about their checking account. Never had one. I never had one. When I went to see them, they sat in with these machines and about to die. Did they ask me? I want is my grass mode. I never had one to say, I didn't make my car payment. Because at that moment, none of those things are even important. Not one. And so if they're not important then, they're not that real important now. Okay? Now, don't, don't, I'm not saying not be concerned, but they're not that. They should never rise to a level in your life where they are bigger than the promise of God that he's given to you in your life. Oh, praise God. In Deuteronomy, uh, man, where was I at? I get my glasses. <laughs> See, one of the things we have to do is that we have to uh, be found as people of faithfulness and integrity. We have little hopes of being entrusted with the things of God when we don't even trust him. If God's going to trust you with his goods, he first needs you to trust him. If I don't trust him, why would he want to entrust me? You know, my son, the only way he'd ever drive my car I got to trust him. Do you think I'm going to give him the keys to my car? He ain't, I, ain't, I, don't, he ain't, I don't even trust him. Do you, do you think I, do you think I give him my shotgun? I don't trust him? No, if I ain't trusted, would you think I give him the keys to my house? Would you give him the keys to your house? Huh? Do everybody have a key to your house? Not everybody, but I can tell you who do have one. People you trust. You know why you trust them? Because they have showed you. You can trust them. See, if I come in my house, I give my keys to my son, I come in, my TV gone, dishwasher gone, guess what? He may, he may have got over on that one, but I bet you he will never, ever, first of all, have a key. From now on, he'll ring the doorbell. And then I'm going to be watching him when we sit now. <laughs> no, 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 nobody. Now, be honest. You, you don't want nobody to come to your house you can't trust, do you? You already heard, they're thieves. Man, you sitting there watching every move they make. Where, what you, can I use your back? Yeah, yeah, let me show you what that is. Then you stand outside the door trying to get a picture of what you got in there and make sure they ain't settling nothing when they're in there. Now, I know y'all laughing, but it's the truth. And then we come to God. Why would God trust me with something if he don't trust me? Huh? Sometimes we're asking God to give us stuff, but we've never showed enough trust in God for him to trust us to handle what he's trying to give us. And so, you know, I, I ain't going to say that God, you know, if I looked at the story of the prodigal son, you know, it, it, it looked like there was a certain amount of trust. That he trusted him when he gave him all his living. He trusted him. I guess he trusted him to do what he knew he was going to do, I guess. Because he did go out and waste every bit of it. But to trust God is so paramount among the saints of God. And if we could ever begin to realize our faithfulness in God, our trusting in God, allows God to trust us with more 
of what he has to offer you. Amen. He's not going to give you power to use on yourself. You know, just like Elijah had that power to call fire down from heaven. He had other people that, you know, the apostles, they came along, the disciples came along, guess what they wanted? They wanted that same power. Didn't they not? Man, let us do that. So no, I don't want you to do that. See, y'all can't look at somebody else's power because the number one is that I remember T.D. Jakes, I heard one of his testimonies a long time ago, and it was very touching. And, you know, sometimes you, you see the man at the end, you didn't see the stuff that was in between. And sometimes you see that and you say, well, you know what? A oh, man, look at him down there, man. I heard guys talking about him like a dog. I may have said something about him too, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, we get jealous. And they said, man, he got a great place down there, man. He got a parking lot, man. He got everything. He buses and everything. You know, but did you know how he got there? We just woke up one day and seen him on TV. And, and, and from that place, we, we began to judge him by what we saw him on TV. But he started telling his testimony about when he, he was on food stamps. Now, you'd never ever dream that. I, I never dreamed that. He talked about how he was on food stamps. His dad was on dialysis and how that he had to take care of his dad. And, you know, they tell me that can be messy sometime. And the, the pump or whatever is doing the transfusion, blood would be everywhere in the basement and all that kind of stuff. And he had to go down and stand in line. He's preaching every Sunday, going and stand in line, getting them food stamps and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. I say, I never would have dreamed that. But what happened is this, is that, but he stayed faithful in that. And see, if God can't trust you with a little bit, do you honestly think God's going to trust you with a whole lot? No, God is not crazy. And so he stayed faithful when others may have said, God, I'm doing all this, and I'm not here getting food stamps. You know, that's humbling. It'd be humbling for me. Well, I'm just telling you. Now, I, I, ain't, I ain't talking against nobody, but I'm just saying for me, it would be a very humbling experience. I've never had them. But I can't tell you I won't ever go get them. The worst thing I'd say, bless God, I'll tell you what, I bet you'll never see me getting a link. I'll tell you what, before I go hungry, I'll get a link. <laughs> Five or six of them. All oh, my kids and my dog, too. I'll sign up everybody in my house. <laughs> We're going to get some link or something because I ain't going to starve. You know, we don't know what God is doing, but whatever he does, it's good. So I'm not, you know, sometimes, like I said, we'll look at the end and, and, and wonder, you know, well, man, no, man yeah, he, no wonder he's preaching. But, but there was a time in his life when it wasn't like that. So don't get mad. Don't desire. Somebody said, well, I want to be like T.D. Jakes. I do not want to be like T.D. Jakes. I appreciate him. But I don't want to go through what he went through to get there. Huh? Do you? No. No, you don't know how many years you may have to spend on the backside of a desert. You don't know how many things you got to go through to get there. I don't want to be there. I'm, I'm cool with him. I can praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and preach it, brother. Preach it. I'm cool with that, but I don't want to look at Paul. I love the man of Paul. Never met him, but I love him. Read his writing. Excited. Do I want to be Paul? Absolutely not. Do I want to have his anointing? Absolutely not. I just want the one God has for me. <laughs> It'll fit me. <laughs> And if it'll fit me, I know I can make it through it. It'll fit me. I think it was last Sunday I talked about uh, the blessings of God, how they design the blessings. Yeah, yeah. they'll design a the blessing. One of a kind. And your design of blessing fits only you like you cannot believe. But in the flip side of the coin, there's a designer trial. <laughs> Let me keep moving. 
Oh, praise God. See, God leads us through the wilderness of this world. In Deuteronomy where he talked about, oh, man, I'm almost through. In, in 8, 1 through 3, he, he led them through the wilderness, and that, and that wilderness leading was for their own good because they didn't know what was in them. You don't never know what's in you until you have to have it. You don't know. You may think right now, boy, I got it. Boy, I'm, 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 I'm good. I got everything I need right now. <laughs> boy, I'll tell you what. That can change in a heartbeat. I know that God knows everything, and I know he knows everything about us, but it's his test that brings it to us that lets us know what's really going on in us. It's extremely important that we keep our hearts with diligence. Always choose to do God's will as we understand it. God humbles us. He makes us barren. He makes us where we're not having kids. Depriving us of good things. The good things of life. And then all of a sudden he feeds us with manna. That's why you should never get down. Never be down. Always stay up, because I always know he is a provider, and he will always provide you with some good things. Even in the midst of bad things, God provides you with some good things. Even in the midst of the wilderness, fighting and going on every day, God made sure one thing every morning, though, he was faithful. If they won, he was faithful. If they lost, he was faithful. He was always there to give them the victory, always. Not one enemy in the wilderness ever triumphed over them. May they have some mild setbacks, may they have a few little scars on the head, but no matter what, they always ended up in victory. So it's not our strength that we're trying to, to operate on it. We've got to get our strength changed from Adam to Christ. That's why the Bible said, I can do all things. Where? Through where? Through Christ that strengthens me. And I can do all things. I can do all things. Say that with my eyes. Through Christ that strengthens me. All right, shake hands, be friendly. In Jesus' name.